much for coming out today, uh, especially on spring break. I know lots of you guys are uh, lots of different places across campus and across the city, so I appreciate you guys coming in um, to visit with Senator Bozeman uh, about a really exciting project we're doing here at UALR. Um, we are working with a group of veterans, World War II history veterans, to do oral histories, collecting oral histories, um, through a particular class in the Donaghy Scholars Program, and so we appreciate the folks from Donaghy Scholars to come in and have an opportunity to visit with the Senator, and this is a busy time for him. Um, Dr. Toro is going to open us up this morning and uh, give a couple comments, but I would like to first acknowledge a couple of really important folks in the room. Um, Mr. Lucas uh, is here with us today, and uh, Mr. Lucas is a World War II veteran, and he and his friends at the Parkstone Place are where we're going to conduct some interviews. About 15 of his friends will be interviewed by Donaghy Scholars in the next couple of weeks. And Dr. Richard Frothingham is a professor emeritus here at UALR. Um, he taught here full time for four decades in the philosophy. Um, I believe he also had some religion and philosophy English. Religion. Yes, sir. yes, sir. Um, but has continued to be active in our community, and we appreciate um, you being here. He is a World War II veteran along with a Korean War veteran, so we appreciate you being here, Dr. Toro. Thank you, Sherry, and good morning, everyone. Again, <coughs> I would like also to uh, express our appreciation for you, uh, to you for being here with us this morning. And also, I would like uh, to uh, extend my appreciation to Senator Bozeman for his interest on what we are doing. This is a very special, uh, I think, occasion. We are celebrating the accomplishments of our students, the Donaghy scholars, but also the accomplishments of our veterans. And merging those two things, I think it's a very, very uh, exciting um, initiative. And let me say that uh, other institutions are working with veteran history projects, but in a very different way. They do a project here and there. We have done something very different. We have integrated the topic as part of one of our Donaghy Scholar courses in such a way that students have to engage with the community. And EOLAR is that. It's an engaged, community engaged institution. So it, it, this is the example of what we want to do as an institution of higher education. It's the type of educational opportunity we would like to afford every single student we have here. And let me say that this partnership with Senator Bozeman office is also very unique. It brings our elected officials. It brings the leaders of our uh, community to the university, and that is something else that we would like to do more of because it's what community engaged universities do. So again, it's a very uh, happy day for us. We should celebrate the accomplishments of our students, the veterans, and the accomplishment of our senator. Again, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much. Very much. Thank you, Dr. So one of the important people in the room, she always stands in the back, and so I walk to the back to say hello to her a bit, but um, Anita is our um, military contact who came to us and talked to us a little bit. It's okay if I sit with you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Anita came to us. Um, she has had a long relationship with the institution and Kathy Oliverio because of our military-friendly status at UALR. And uh, Anita and Kathy talk on a regular basis, and. Um, Kathy is very active. Kathy Alvario is our um, military student success um, director at the institution. And um, so Kathy uh, takes me with her out into the community um, to attend different events. And one of the events that we attended um, was a Chamber of Commerce uh, event. And um, we were um, having a little bit of lunch, and Anita mentioned that there were lots of people um, that she had talked to about partic participating in this project. And um, your office, as you know, hosted a workshop um, to train individuals on how to conduct oral histories, um, because that is something that you need to go through very specific <coughs> training for, but particularly for the Library of Congress submissions. And so um, Kathy attended a workshop that um, was hosted by your office, um, statewide uh, workshop, 
and then as a result um, brought the project back to our campus. And so um, we have, as you know, um, started a class and there are a couple students in the room who, who are part of that class and one of the students, um, Adam Ness, uh, you had an opportunity to meet a little bit earlier. Um, I, you should call on him at, at any point in time to ask him about his learning. Uh, so <laughs> the students have been um, involved in familiarizing themselves a little bit with the time period, um, the cultural implications of what was going on, um, how it impacted our country. And um, one of the projects they looked at is World War II propaganda pieces and did an analysis of um, the propaganda that um, our country <coughs> produced um, through a particular uh, art project. And so the students have done analysis, but they are getting ready to embark on the oral histories. And Kathy <coughs> and trained the students very much in the same, the training that she received from your office. Um, so we're really excited about getting to do this. And so we wanted to uh, give you an opportunity to talk to us about, I know your father was, um, military as a veteran, and I know this is really important to you as an individual, um, but also from a perspective as a leader in our country um, about bringing these stories forward. And as an individual who has done a lot of work in oral histories, I know how important it is to collect the oral history, because oftentimes the secondary research is going to be there, whereas the primary research, what happened to people, their personal stories, their connections, um, we lose those and we lose the individuals. So could you talk to us a little bit about why this project's been important for you? Yeah, very much so. First of all, I want to thank you all so much for having me. Now, Anita, you look, give me the sign. I have a tendency to mumble. So uh, if you can't hear me, just look like you can't hear me, and I'll speak up a little bit. But it really is great to be with you all. And I just want to thank you, first of all, for being such a veterans-friendly school. And that's really important. We're a nation at war. Uh, we have lots of people deployed. We've had lots of people deployed. Uh, we've been at war now for many years and uh, as we're seeing in Belgium and, and the events that are unfolding throughout the world, whether it's Iran or the, the, uh, the Russians, you know, rearming, the Chinese rearming, uh, building islands in a, you know, in the, uh, uh, you know, in a situation, just all of these things going on uh, right now really requires a, a strong military presence. One of the things that I'm very proud of is Congress, several years ago, uh, creating a new GI Bill that's a good GI Bill. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not perfect, but it's, it's pretty good. And it's certainly much, much better than ever before. And so, uh, like I said, that's something that we can all be very proud of as a country, that we do take care of our veterans. The other thing that we have to remember is these are earned benefits. These are not benefits that are just given. Uh, like I said, it's part of it. And so uh, the fact that you all do do such a good job really is appreciated. This is important to me. In fact, I was over at the archives on Friday and, uh, you know, looking at, we have a, uh, a group of submariners in northwest Arkansas. And the submariners, the retired submariners, what they will do is adopt a boat that has sunk, you know, during World War II or, or at some point, and that becomes their boat. And so I had somebody call over the archives and ask if they had information about this boat that I wanted to come and, you know, hopefully put together a scrapbook, you know, for this group and then give it to them. Well, I went over there and literally they had, a, you know, one of the carts at the library just filled with stuff. And so there is a lot of information out there. But as you mentioned, the first person, you know, the, the, it's easy to look at documents. I know exactly who was on that boat now. Uh, you know, I, I know how the boat was designed and this and that, but sadly, of course, this was a boat that was sunk during World War II. You don't have any first-person accounts. But we do, because of your all's work, we will have first-person accounts of people that served on those boats, you know, during those times. And uh, my dad was, uh, my dad joined the, he talked his mom into, into joining the National Guard uh, when he was a junior in high school, he was 17, and uh, immediately they called up the guard unit uh, out of Ozark. I grew up in Fort Smith, as did he. Called up the guard unit, and so he went off uh, to get ready for World War II when he was 17. And so, which was, you know, very, very common back then. Uh, Wound up as a waist gunner on B-17s, got through that, and then stayed in the stayed in the service, uh, and did 20 some odd years in the Air Force. 
these gentlemen, uh, this group, really didn't talk, you know, a whole lot about the war. And so that's another reason that it's so important. You know, they just came back and they not only rebuilt our country, but they provided the security for Europe as they rebuilt. And you're learning more about, you know, these things as you visit with these people. Uh, but, you know, Europe was devastated uh, beyond imagination. And again, the United States uh, provided the security so that they could build back a lot of the resources so they could build back and become, uh, you know, what they've become besides building our own country. So there's so many great reasons for doing this and uh, uh, it's, good for, it's good for our veterans, it's good for history uh, to, to, you know, make it such that we keep this stuff for generations to follow. But it's also good for y'all, you know, as you participate and really get to know these individuals. And the thing that I've learned is, you know, in dealing with uh, so many throughout the years, it's ordinary people doing extraordinary things that they were called to do. And, uh, you know, some of those things almost being unimaginable. And many times it being, uh, in fact, one of the, growing up in Fort Smith, um, my wife, who's also from Fort Smith, we started dating when we were in high school. But one of her good friends, Dad, was a salesman uh, at a, uh, oh, a bat fixtures type place, plumbing supply type place. And he was just this old guy that was just as nice as he could be, and we'd go to the lake with his family and all this kind of stuff. And it turned out that uh, when AETN did their series uh, several years ago about our World War II vets, uh, this guy was one of the, the poster guys. And, you know, I didn't know, you know, he'd even served, you know. He never said anything about it, you know. But he was with Patton, and essentially in every major battle uh, that Patton fought throughout the entire world, the entire war. Again, and I say that just as a, a regular guy, uh, just a, an ordinary <coughs> guy that truly did extraordinary things. And that's really what we want to capture is, is those stories. So, Adam. <laughs> you I'm going to take your advice. Tell me what you're finding when you do these things. Tell me about it. Well, right now, as we're just preparing for the oral interviews, um, right now we're getting those interview skills down just about how to really draw out information and okay. the stories from our candidates. And it's learning that process and learning how to prepare for the interview to <coughs> get the most out of it has uh, been real fulfilling. That's great. One thing I will add to it is, um, as you said, we are a country at war, and most of the students who are in our freshman class um, were born in 1996, 1997, 1998. I think you and I can remember where we were in our work uh, places at the, in those particular years. Um, and so um, this generation, the country has always been at war for this particular generation, or at least at what we call conflict. Um, and um, so our me we have been saturated in our with our media and uh, with war. And so one of the, I think, significant things that ha has happened for the students so far is Ken Burns, as you know, did uh, a series, but at the end of that series, <coughs> he did a documentary on Easy Company. And um, to hear the oral histories of um, individuals. And I think that it, many of the students commented that it created a personal connection for them. I think that they will carry into some of their own um, oral history interviews. So I think that will be good for them. Um, one, one other thing uh, is, is we have a couple of people in the room who are uh, veterans that are part of our student organization, SAM, uh, students affected by the military. And again, Kathy, I know we say her name quite a bit. She's real important to our university. Kathy Oliverio is the uh, faculty uh, advisor for that particular group, and there are a couple of folks in here from their, uh, that organization, and they may have some questions that they want to ask or comments they'd like to make or um, those kinds of things, so. Yeah, oh, very, very good. And, and we have been, for many of you, we have been in conflict, you know, s since you've been around, and, uh, and that's a sad thing. The good thing, though, is that it's not conflict like we knew in World War I and World War II. Uh, and so, you know, losing hundreds of thousands of people, you know, in World War II. Uh, in fact, I was, I got off the, I was getting ready to come home yesterday from Washington, and a group of uh, ladies, uh, elderly ladies, were, were uh, in wheelchairs, you know, getting off the planes, and the, the whole, you know, to their credit, the whole, uh, it seemed like everybody in the airport, you know, was clapping and stuff. 
it was Rosie the Riveters that were mm -hmm. being honored with a, uh, you know, an honor flight to Washington. And it was quite an experience, you know, seeing them. And again, when I was at the archives last Friday, uh, they showed me the original Rosie the Riveter poster. Uh, and there's really been several of those, uh, several different individuals featured. This was the one that was done by the War Department. Mm -hmm. And then Norman Rockwell, you know, later on, you know, made others, you know, famous. But it really does show the, you know, just the total commitment that we've had during various times of our history where the entire nation was at war. And then also that we forget the, uh, and hopefully the other countries are doing this also, that the, uh, you know, the sacrifice of the entire world. Uh, I was at a, a meeting the other day and they were talking about the Russian sacrifice during World War II. They lost 25 million people. You know, as a result of that conflict, was just almost unimaginable. And so, as you deal with the Russians, and you know, you deal with different entities, you have to again, you know, keep that in perspective, because uh, you know, uh, it, it wasn't too long ago, you know, that they were in that situation. So it's really good. So let's hear from some of our vets. <laughs> we do appreciate your service. Thank you, sir. Uh, Jacob Long, I'm the SGA president and a uh, veteran of Operation Iraq Freedom. Um, I'm curious how you think that, uh, you know, these types of uh, programs and, you know, honoring our, our veterans and telling their story affects, you know, the next generation and how they'll serve and, and their level of patriotism and commitment to uh, serving the country. I think it's really important. When I was growing up, uh, when you guys were young, uh, some of the others in the room growing up, on 4th of July, you know, when you said everybody that served in the military stand up, you know, at church or, or some other public gathering, the entire room would grow up because you had World War I, you had World War II, <coughs> Vietnam was going on then, you had the draft, you had the Cold War, uh, and as a result, a, very high percentage of the population had actually served in the military or was serving. Uh, our numbers now are very, very slight, you know, compared to ever before. So my generation has not served, you know, near as much. And so you have a situation where my children, you know, who are your age, uh, they don't really have anybody that served. You know, they, they, don't, they don't know a whole lot about the military except what they see on television and what they hear, okay? So I do, I think it's really important, you know, that, that we, uh, you know, make sure that, uh, that people do understand what the military is all about. And, uh, and this is just a great way to get that message out. And uh, it's, it's a different, uh, just a different world than it was really just, just a generation ago. So it's almost shocking to me, you know, when you guys at the 4th of July and yourself, you know, those are the years, there's just a handful of people. I mean, it's a very, very slight number uh, compared to the old days. Thank you. Have you all got any, our, our senior vets, have you all got anything? Well, I want to talk about how other people, other nations have made great <coughs> sacrifices and Something that uh, struck me uh, this winter <coughs> was that when I was growing up around uh, what we call Armistice Day, you have American Legion uh, volunteers out uh, uh, asking for donations and giving poppies to people to wear. And uh, lots of people wore poppies around that time. I don't think I've seen anybody uh, in this country this fall wearing a poppy. But when I see uh, newscasts of Great Britain, I see uh, the Prime Minister and the Cabinet members, they're all wearing poppies. They, they make a great deal of what they call Remembrance Day because they suffered horrendous uh, uh, casualties in uh, World War I. Tremendous, a whole generation of young men wiped out, among the French too. It's, it, 
Uh, we, we lost a lot of people in both wars, but we did not lose as many as, the, as these other nations did. We spoke of the Russians. They, they, their uh, losses in World War uh, II were catastrophic. And, and, we, and you're right to say we need to remember and appreciate their sacrifice. No, very good. And, and, and you're right. I was in, uh, I was in Great Britain uh, a year ago. And they were really, uh, there's tremendous uh, recognition, you know, of World War I, especially with the anniversaries you know, coming up about that time. But uh, it is hard to imagine the loss of life that happened, you know, during those times with the, uh, the French, the English, the Germans, uh, the Italians, you know, all of those people that uh, suffered so greatly, uh, a good percentage of their population. And you had a situation then where, where the armaments uh, were, the new armaments were much more um, uh, deadly and lethal, and they were using old tactics. There were two important uh, new developments in World War One. One was the uh, machine gun, and the other was uh, the uh, new explosive that they put inside the artillery shells that made the artillery shells more powerful than they had when they were just loaded with gunpowder. And uh, both of those uh, developments made uh, for high, high casualties in World War I. So you're right, you make a great point that uh, that's something that... Uh, Nobel know. intended his high explosives to be used for mining for the advancement of mankind, and instead they were used to make artillery shells more powerful. And that's something as you, you know, prepare to interview and stuff, uh, that's something that, uh, you know, you might uh, it's kind of an interesting niche that you get the American perspective some, from some of our soldiers that served in the occupation you know, after the war. Uh, you know, some of their stories about the deprivation and, and the tough things. It's interesting, my dad uh, stayed in the service and so I spent six years in London when I was little. And uh, when I came back to, to Arkansas, I was really an English kid. My dad didn't like the uh, the base schools, uh, so he put my brother and I in an English boys' school, and uh, so I wore the, the little uniform, you know, the little shorts <laughs> and the tie, and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but it was an interesting experience. It was in the 1950s, and they were still rationing in uh, in England, and I can remember playing in the bunkers and stuff and the devastation. But literally, uh, you got this. Back then, everybody was <coughs> coal to stay warm with, to heat the homes. And so you got like this block of coal, you know, once a month. So there really wasn't any heat. So every night we'd go to bed with a hot water bottle. And uh, my mother had one of those old, uh, really like an 18th century coal warmer, you know, with the things with the long handles, with the, you know, with the coal on the end, and you, you run it across the bed to kind of warm it up before you got in. And she'd literally do that. And that's just how it was. You know, like I said, the, the rations and all of that. The, um, so it was an interesting situation, but that would be a, a great niche, you know, to, to also, like I said, maybe find some of those individuals that were there during the occupation. What else have we got going on? We can talk about anything you want to talk about. Have you got any, would you like to come uh, up? Give me the subject. I like to look at the people I'm going to talk to instead of my wife. <laughs> <laughs> and I can uh, kind of read the expression on you. Uh, yeah. I am Kenneth Lucas. I entered the Army in don't know, uh, September 15, 1941. For, uh, yeah. And uh, I was. Uh, I, just got out of school one semester at Arkansas Tech and uh, entered into the service and after finished basic training I went to veterinary school for three months. They had to have meat inspectors and uh, horse doctors. They still had the first cows at that time. And uh, so we worked both. We worked, uh, I worked as a nurse maid to a view and also a meat dairy inspector. The thousands of pounds, you say you take it or you're not. And so 
After that, I <coughs> experienced with the uh, horses, we uh, had a general hospital. And uh, we worked there just like a, the human hospital. If an uh, animal was sick and couldn't take care of it, the dispensary type, they said to us. So we would took care of it. And uh, following that, they disbanded the 1st Cavalry, and they sent us to Fort Carson, Colorado to take care of the mules. They had the 10th Infantry Division at that time. And uh, we went with the 10th Infantry Division to uh, Hutter Lincoln Military Reservation in California. And uh, at that time, they were training uh, for invasion in Italy. But uh, they had an invasion before we got ready, so they had to disband the mules. So there we were uh, out in a 100 naked military reservation with Randolph First pa Castle there. The commanding officer occupied the castle. <laughs> but uh, from there, uh, I was sent back. I was sent to New York City, and uh, first thing I said to the uh, personnel officer, I said, I want to go to Europe. So you're not going anywhere, you're staying right here. And uh, so I was a meat and dairy inspector in the, in the metropolitan area of New York City. And uh, also, uh, I had a hardship tour in uh, Atlantic City. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that is a hardship tour. <laughs> <laughs> as a big dear inspector for the hospital. And that was really a good experience. Also, while I was in that area, I, they needed a chicken inspector down in Selbyville, Delaware, <laughs> all the way on the peninsula. And it was a quite unique place we inspected. The Army had, uh, the military had 100% freeze on all poultry, all poultry. And uh, the owner there would try to get uh, coals or something wrong with it, so he could take it down to the black market in D.C. and sell it for a big price, which uh, our job was is to get good, uh, palatable food and of uh, the right uh, type for human consumption. And we had it, uh, the line, we worked uh, as many as 40,000 pounds a day, but we had some good help. Had German prisoners of war working. <laughs> The contract, the military contract, about to the uh, the owner of the facility. That was quite an experience. Uh, the uh, the built the German prisoners at that time had been captured in Africa, and they were quite loyal to the U.S. Army. And uh, when uh, the dispute would come up, well, like wait, we would. Uh, way the, uh, the poultry in Silverville, they way up again in New York. I got a call from the boss up there and said, well, we got a trouble with our weight. And I uh, always more in, uh, in Silverville than was what they received. <laughs> and I said, well, we're going to take care of that. So I put a German prisoner out there with his uh, uh, employee, and we came up with the correct weight. And uh, we had another dispute come up. And he said, you got to uh, take that prisoner word over mine. I said, what do you think he's sitting there for? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that was quite an experience. And after that, uh, I experienced uh, a, a little break of service. I meant to say, when I went in, at first, uh, it was, uh, pay was great. $31, uh, $30 a day for uh, once a month. They had just raised the pay from $21 a month in July, and I went in September. $30 a day for once a month. Uh, following the discharge from the uh, military at that time, I entered into uh, UCA at Conway and graduated there with a degree in uh, biological science and physical science. Then I got in the car, went straight to Colorado State University, and I graduated with a degree in animal genetics. And I was teaching school. I came back uh, in 1950 to Little Rock, went into the capital there at the uh, teacher's headquarters, and I said, gee, I'm working. I'm looking for a job. I just got out of school. So I got just the thing for it. So uh, 
a, a, a vocational agricultural teacher in Lolo, which was a great assignment. And then in uh, February of 1951, they called me to active duty as a commissioned officer. And uh, uh, I uh, went to school again in Fort Sam Houston, Texas. And uh, I went to <coughs> Korea. I served by Tire Bank Korea and came back to the United States. And I received another hardship tour in Pine Bluff Arsenal. <laughs> <laughs> And my, since my parents lived in uh, in uh, Babelville at that time, well, I, I just like home. <laughs> and uh, following uh, uh, the tour in uh, Vietnam and uh, in Pine Bluff Arsenal, I went to Germany. And I stayed there three years. And uh, during that time, they needed somebody to help run the hospital. So I was selected to attend Baylor University uh, Medical uh, Hospital Administration School at Fort Sam Houston. I had professors of, uh, of the military at Baylor also. So the Baylor University awarded us with a bachelor's degree in hospital administration. And from there, I worked a while in the research hospital in uh, Edgewood, Maryland, in uh, Chemical research. I said, I guess it's called a five level relationship, but that was our headquarters for approving. So at, at that time, uh, we would get in people and work you on the psychobabetics. And it was not, it was really an interesting subject and an interesting endeavor because what the military had in mind at that time <coughs> is temporary incapacitation and not permanent. Anytime you get lead, that's going to leave a residue. But uh, with the uh, psychomimetics, uh, we would take a man and try to arrive at an incapacitating dose where they could disperse it in aerosol. And uh, well, there is some difficulty on that uh, because before we disperse it, uh, our subjects are, were uh, military. We get them in, and, and uh, my job was to uh, uh, recruit those too. Uh, and uh, what we would have to do is find out just what the dosage would be for incapacitation. And we'd give them the uh, aerosol and then uh, test them along. And we had a psychiatrist there and nursing staff and everything to make sure that they were uh, treated good and to reach incapacitation. But we uh, also learned from that that when you put this aerosol down, you're not going to get good, healthy people. You're going to get babies, you're going to get young people, you're going to get old people. <coughs> so it was very limited on what you could use it for. Then subsequently, I uh, came back to uh, the Fort Bliss area as a hospital administrator in McAfee Hospital in White Sand Proving Ground. And from there, I went to Vietnam. And it was a hospital administrator there for a field hospital. We had the, the helicopters come in and bring the patients. And, and uh, I said they uh, fought in shifts. You could see them going out in the morning to engage in battle and come back that evening. And what was really unique about this, uh, the commanding general of the uh, division at that time would come down and visit with us at the hospital. And read, he would visit there, he'd come in and talk to the patients and say, well, how'd you get in? And when he came in for the, uh, came back for the intelligent review, he probably knew more than intelligent people would give him <laughs> because he talked to the patients. <laughs> and uh, there was quite quite time. And the uh, general was successful at that time that one of the greatest difficulties we had over there in Vietnam were the uh, uh, passage, underground passage, tunnels. And uh, he said that they had specialists throughout the world come and they couldn't overcome the difficulty of the, the tunnels. And to give you an example of what those tunnels were, they're just almost endless. Uh, at this large hospital we had, we had a truck continuously hauling water to do our laundry. Where do we put the uh, uh, 
residue from laundry or the dirty water in a tunnel. Never did fill up. It just ugly of uh, the, the water. And then after uh, uh, my tour there in Vietnam, I had another hardship tour. I was signed to the surgeon's office in Presidio, San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see the military has been real good to me. They took me in and they gave me an education and they provided for me. And I'd be glad to take your question. I have a question for you, Colonel Lucas. Yes. Did you know that Uncle Sam was a food inspector? I knew what? Did you know that Uncle Sam was a food inspector? Yeah. That's a board question in the Army for food inspectors. I'm a food inspector. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the original Uncle Sam. The original Uncle Sam. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. I hope I didn't bore you too much. <laughs> I know that you um, want to take some photographs and whatnot, and um, we want to make sure we get an opportunity for lots of people to visit with you. I know some one-on-one -on -one folks want to uh, visit with you. Um, I just want to say thank you um, for um, engaging with the institution. You know, we, as Dr. Crow indicated, we are a community engaged institution and we're grateful for the opportunity for our students, um, like Adam, to be able to um, see the impact of the work that they do in the classroom. Um, I think it's one of the most meaningful things. I know whenever we are in kindergarten, we produce things and we take them home and we, our parents put them on the refrigerator and somewhere that gets lost along the way. And our aim in college is to reunite that kind of feeling for our students that they produce refrigerated girl worthy stuff um, and that they see the impact of their learning in the community um, and the community can see the impact of the UALR Trojan. So we're really grateful for the opportunity to get to work with your office and um, we're grateful, uh, Dr. Frothingham and Mr. Lucas, that you're willing to share your stories with us um, because I know that sometimes these are difficult stories to tell. So we're very grateful for your willingness to be here today and um, another year. Well, thanks for having us. And uh, another thing that I hope as a result of this, I really would like for you to get uh, a deeper relationship with the Library of Congress and the archives. And uh, as instructors and also as students, there's such a wealth of information. It's one of the things that, that simply just isn't utilized as much as it should be. Uh, and our office can help you with that. Okay, so we'll, we'll work out something. Uh, but again, that's, that's just something that uh, I think would be great. Uh, you know, using the, the vast door, the researchers, the whatever, you know, as you put all this together. But, so there's lots of opportunities, lots of different things to do. And I would just echo, you know, the, the, the fact that you all do do such a good job of uh, being such good uh, community members, state of Arkansas members uh, in the sense of you know doing lots of things uh, uh, you know that you don't have to do but you need to do that's what it's all about you know, is everybody kind of helping out and uh, and this is a great project and I just you know appreciate you all your willingness to, to jump on it and uh, you know to, to keep these stories uh, so that the next generation generations after this will have them and they go snoop around the Library of Congress and the archives. So hopefully you all will be there, okay? Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thanks for your time.